Chapter 5. Jeffrey's Vacation. In the morning, I was the first one up and I was really hungry for some odd reason. And I thinking that Jeffrey was going to have a hard day. So I decided to surprise him with the oatmeal he had never gotten the day before. I got everything cooked up and had it covered and I had just covered the pot when I heard a little footstep behind me. I started to speak and turn at the same time. Good morning, Jeffrey. I made you some. Now, I knew Jeffrey was bruised up from his fall, and I also knew that Bruce has always looked worse on the second day. But at that stage of the game, I didn't know how much worse bruises could look on a kid with leukemia. When I turned around, I gasped, and my hand came to my mouth. Jeffrey had the two worst black eyes I'd ever seen, and his nose was swollen about twice his normal size. He saw my reaction and winced. What's wrong, Stephen? How does your face feel, Jeffy? It feels thick, thick and hot. Why? It's um a little swollen. What do you mean? Do I look funny? What if the doctors think I look stupid? I'm going to go look in the mirror. Before I could even think of stopping him, he ran to the foyer and looked in our hallway mirror. I ran over and he looked in the at me with horror in his eyes. Steven, I look like a raccoon. You do not look like a raccoon. Actually, he looked like some deranged anteater, but I didn't figure that would be a thing to tell him. Yes, I do. Oh no, what if I stay this way forever? You're not gonna stay that way forever, Jeffy. People get black eyes all the time. And if they never got better, the streets would be crowded with raccoon people. Soon the raccoon people would have found each other and breathe. I was on a roll there. Here, preschools would fill up with strange ring-eyed children. Soon the raccoons would be taking over the streets, stealing from our garbage cans, leaving the eerie trails of dainty more beef stew cans in their wake. Gangs of them would haunt the malls, buying up all the black and gray striped sweatshirt sportswear. The rivers and the valleys would run with... Stephen, you're joking, right? What's for breakfast? Oatmeal! Yay, moat, yay, moat meal. And just like that, Jeffrey was over his crisis, which is pretty amazing. I have a single zit, and I want to crawl under my bed and hide for three days with worth of food. This kid looks at it like he just lost the bat boxing match with a gorilla, and it takes him like five minutes and a bowl of hot cereal. Forget about it. While Jeffrey was eating, I snuck upstairs to warn the rent about Jeffrey's look. I figured my mom could was going to have enough shocks to deal with. So I should spare her this one if I could. It worked. Or at least the rents managed to hide the reaction from Jeffrey when they came downstairs. We all sat at the breakfast table pretending to be our normal, normal and cheerful. And you know how the people, like when you watch on the Brady Bunch, you think, oh, come on, nobody is this happy. What's wrong with you people? And who picks out your clothes? Well, breakfast was sort of like that. Only instead of the clothing problem, we had the unmentionable cancer problem. Goodbyes were pretty uneventful, and Jeffrey even managed to bug me, which is probably a good sign. On his way out the door, he turned to make fun of his brother. You're going to school. You're going to school. If he had known what was coming up for his day, he would have been begging me to smuggle him to school in my backpack. Once my mom and, and Jeffy left, my dad and I just kind of slid around the house getting ready to face the day. Not, not quite ready to face each other. We got into the car well, word one being spoken on the actual ride. And it was so quiet between us that I imagined I could hear the tread, tire tread rubbing against the road. I couldn't wait to hop out there and get to school. But somehow, when we did pull up to the building, I didn't make any move to get out. My dad nearly looked at me, and I was kind of stared right through his shoulder. After about a minute of this, we muttered, we mumbled at once, okay, well, well, okay. And that was the deepest conversation we would have all week. I got out and went to school, and when I came around the corner, 
toward the home room, I saw Renee and forgot about everything else. She was wearing this shirt that was clingy and shiny and maybe a little see-through with a skirt that was that just wasn't quite doing its whole job. I stopped and stared at her for far too long until Annette banged my arm. Check her out. There is no way that doesn't violate the dress code. I hope she gets marched to the office. It's disgusting. Don't you think so, Stephen? Stephen? Stephen! So at least Annette was talking to me again. When I tore my eyes away from Renee, the contrast was pretty strong. And that was doing the 1970s retro thing, I guess. She had this sweater that was pretty tough to describe. It looked like what you'd get if all your parents' favorite dinosaur rock bands died and left you with their extra fabric. And then a little blind lady sewed the pieces together with a tastefully burnt orange thread. It made a statement, though. It truly did. Uh, yeah, sure. Oh, my God, Stephen, I almost forgot. Stephen, how's your brother? Did you get in trouble? I didn't get in trouble, and he's uh, fine. And I, I'm sorry I yelled at you on the bus. I'm sorry, too, Stephen. I know how much you care about your brother and must have been worried. Me? Worried? Maybe. You might have, um, you might notice that was, this was the first perfect time for me to tell Annette the whole story. But for some reason, I didn't tell, didn't want to tell anyone at school. And it turned out that once I decided not to tell Annette, at this moment, I became, it became almost impossible to tell anybody. So for the rest of the week, while I was walking around in a fog, I didn't say a word. I joked around with my friends, played the drums, sat in school, and acted even more lame than usual around Lynette. Renee, but I didn't let anybody know what was going on with Jeff. It was weird. The longer I pretended everything was normal at school, the more I believed everything was normal. I started thinking over and over again. Doctors were wrong all the time. You hear about these malpractice things every day and people get medicine that's not even theirs. I bet Jeffrey's down there in Philly guzzling cheesesteaks, having a great time, getting waited on hand and foot by mom, while I'm up here eating all the hungry man dinners on the East Coast, and Dad is pretending that I'm some odd 13-year-old stranger who just moved in to keep the microwave warm while his real family is away. Meanwhile, that wasn't the way things were actually happening. I found out later that my mom, that my dad was getting horrible phone reports from my mom for an hour each night long after Jeffrey and I were both asleep. So in a sense, my dad was shielding me by not talking. I could have used some companionship that week, but maybe I wouldn't have believed anything about Jeff Jeffrey until I was ready, no matter what dad said. The week went by in this half sleep, sort, half wake sort of way, uh, for me at least. While I was staring at Renee in fifth period math and praying nobody would make her change that outfit, Jeffrey was getting strapped down to a gurney while Annette was smacking my arm again. The doctor was shoving a huge needle through Jeffrey's back into his hip all the way into the bone. While I was laughing at some joke the teacher hadn't heard, Jeffrey was screaming as a needle sucked out the bone marrow out of him. But I was just thinking about me and about how ridiculous it was that everyone expect me was getting freaked out over this stupid bloody nose. The only time all week I, when I truly felt all right was when I was playing drums. I've always been pretty serious about hitting the old practice pad at home, but now I was living in a conversation free dinner TV dinner zombie zone. Basically, had nothing else to do. It was truly ridiculous. Within five days after Jeffrey's fall, I had gotten to the point where I was spending 25 minutes a night playing double stroke rolls on the surface of a dime without missing or even moving the coin. I knew my drum teacher, Mr. Stroll, was going to be pretty impressed with my progress. Before this, he had assigned me 
maybe two pages in each of three different exercise books every week. But now I was doing two pages per night in each book. I was also practicing for my upcoming conga drum stardom. Mr. Wantress lent me a pair of really expensive bongos to use at home, along with a huge stack of ancient Latin jazz records. He even called Mr. Stroll. They had, they had played in bands together. Isn't it weird when grown-ups have actual lives to tell him what I was practicing on them? Fortunately, my dad has a Stone Age stereo system in the basement with an actual turntable. So I was playing along with at least one whole Latin record each night. I know, I know. I'm sure you're thinking about how my new superhuman drum schedule must have been cutting into my homework time. And in fact, you would be correct. Except that all I completely stopped doing homework the day Jeffrey got sick and I didn't start again until I got busted by my teachers much much later. I sometimes look at my homework assignments and occasionally even wrote a heading on a paper as if I was about to attempt to work but somehow I wound up going to school empty-handed every day. In class too I just started basically blanking out every period every day. You might also think that lots of my friends would notice if their pal Steven stopped doing homework, schoolwork, starting, started staring off into the pace 85% of the time and suddenly avoided any mention of his family. But you'd be wrong there. I think every group has a guy for every different function, like the sympathetic guy, the funny guy, the jock guy, the guy who gets picked on and never really thought about it before, but apparently to my friends, I had two roles, the funny guy and the drunk guy. So as long as I carried a pair of sticks and kept the humor coming, nobody was going to guess anything was up with me, except Annette. Pretty much every morning in homeroom, she would ask me what's wrong. A few days, the first few days, I would make a joke and say nothing was the matter. After that, I got more and more impatient with her every time she asked. I kept hoping that if I was just snappish enough, she would just leave me alone. Meanwhile, she stuck with me. She was my best friend, maybe my only true friend, but I wasn't seeing it. There was only one way I was communicating with the outside world at all. It was my through my English journal. Miss Palma has this rule. If you pull down your page, it shows your journal is private. Well, my journal is starting to look like something, some kind of weird origami factory. The with page after page folded on different angles and different and, and edges sticking out all the place. Of course, Miss Palma had known that I was doing something strange because again and again we'd be writing three or four page, I'd be writing three or four pages supposedly about these completely impersonal topics and then folding down all the pages one by one. But either she really believed I was having deep emotional reactions to questions like, should our school have uniforms? Or she was just giving me enough rope to hang myself. Here's the journal I wrote on the sixth day after my mom and Jeffrey went away, the day before they came back. If I could say anything to I wanted to anyone in the world right now. I would be all over Annette. 